the people on that board never Everybody rise through. for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> Have no sound. Yeah. I'll call to order the February 28th regular business meeting of the Board of Supervisors. And for everybody, this meeting is being recorded. Um, I want to start off with a presentation by Colleen Terry, who's the president of Econ Partners. Um, she is going to provide to us information around a proposal to identify funding sources and eligible products or projects within Lower Gwinnett. Colleen? Absolutely. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, thank you for including me on your agenda. I appreciate that and for allowing me to uh, be here virtually. I had a scheduling conflict, so I appreciate we're able to uh, present this way or meet this way. Um, Ecom Partners, we uh, are actually celebrating our 10th year this year. It'll be 10 years in April um, since uh, we founded the firm. Uh, we're a small um, boutique, I would say, economic development consulting firm, and we are focused exclusively uh, on public funding. So when I say public funding, I'm meaning full spectrum. So um, we uh, work hand in glove with our clients to, and many of whom are municipalities, to identify priorities, uh, generally on an annual basis, but certainly, you know, recurring throughout the year, uh, identify those, uh, align them with available funding sources, uh, and then identify as other funding sources, uh, for example, ARPA funds, federal funds that have, you know, becoming available pretty much on a daily basis, uh, marry those priorities with uh, the priority projects with the funding sources. Uh, and then we actually complete the applications. Uh, what we do is largely relationship-based. So we have excellent relationships with analysts from you know, all the state agencies we work with, DCED, uh, DEP, DCNR, uh, certainly labor and industry to the degree we need to involve them. Uh, we are also a state consultant to the Office of Budget. If you're familiar with the RACP program, Office of Budget administers RACP. Uh, Econ, we're on our second five-year contract with Office of Budget to be an official uh, state consultant on behalf of the RACP program. So, uh, you know, the projects where we're on this as the state consultant side, of course, we're not also representing a a municipality or a grantee or a private entity receiving funds, uh, but we do certainly have uh, both public, private. I guess also nonprofit projects who uh, are RACP recipients and, and there are, uh, so we have a great deal of, of history and experience with the program uh, and an relationship with the Office of Budget. Uh, and we do deal um, you know, with additional state agencies and, and federal agencies as well. So we do quite a bit of uh, EPA funding, uh, EDA, which is Economic Development Administration, uh, Pima and FEMA, uh, and we work with some Homeland Security funding as well, particularly for our municipal clients. Um, so we, uh, our client base is, uh, I would say a spectrum, it's, it's a healthy mix of public, so county and municipal clients. Uh, we represent some industrial development authorities and redevelopment authorities as well. Uh, we certainly have uh, several nonprofit clients, uh, certainly fire companies as well. A um, number of fire companies we do funding for, and then institutional, so hospital systems, healthcare systems, uh, independent hospitals, colleges, universities, uh, and development clients. So we have a, a nice spectrum, uh, I think, of clients uh, we work with, and we'd love to work with Lower Gwinnett, of course. Uh, we um, are located in Radnor, so Delaware County. I split my time between that office, it's a full service office, uh, and our office in Harrisburg. Uh, so the work that we do with public funding, particularly with the Commonwealth, we need to be in Harrisburg quite a bit. So again, whether it's face-to-face -face meetings with the agencies, the analysts, the decision makers, uh, Commonwealth Financing Authority Board, uh, we do uh, interface with legislative offices and the governor's office quite a bit on behalf of funding. Uh, it's important to note we're not lobbyists, so we are probably deliberately <laughs> not government relations uh, firm, but we do support the work of, of folks who do that work, and we work hand in glove uh, with them uh, on particular projects where that's a, a relationship that uh, is engaged. Uh, most of what we do, frankly, and where, where our work originates is word of mouth. Um, so generally, um, I would say nearly all of our projects are referral uh, or relationship-based. Uh, our oldest client, my first client, actually when I started the firm is still a client today. 
Uh, I think we've done 12 or 13 projects together now, and we currently have two that are active. And over the years, you know, we've been referred by existing clients, by engineers, architects, again, uh, sometimes government relations professionals, uh, or just colleagues, you know, other, you know, managers, supervisors, commissioners. It's, um, you know, generally a trusted relationship. We don't, you know, we don't produce a thing, right? So we're not making widgets. It's what we do is all results-based. Um, so it's important that what we do um, is, is well thought out. Uh, we put a great deal of time into our grant writing uh, and we're very careful to uh, make sure that our work product is, is excellent um, so that what we produce has an excellent chance of not just meeting the priorities of that particular funding program in that particular funding round or year, which can change. Uh, year to year, it certainly changes when uh, an administration changes. For example, um, you know, if we do uh, engage, which we would love to do, of course, uh, this will cross a gubernatorial um, uh, administration. So that's important because you know, we prepare our, cl our existing clients for that possibility. For example, if you've got projects that aren't yet under grant agreement but are working towards that direction as we approach a change in a, a gubernatorial office, uh, we often accelerate some of those projects to see if we can get them under grant agreement uh, before that office changes so that we can protect that funding. Uh, but then we also, once that office does change and they establish uh, deputies and secretaries, uh, and they then implement their priorities uh, before the funding rounds open. We spend a good deal of time with those, you know, the folks that we know and, and introducing ourselves to the folks we don't, uh, and then clearly understanding the priorities of that individual secretary or that office uh, ahead of the funding round opening. And then we, of course, communicate that uh, to our clients. Um, but as I said, we, we do sort of full spectrum funding. So identify the priorities on an annual or ongoing basis, uh, we do the applications. Uh, once we submit the applications, we do full post-submission support. So again, those relationships are so important, they come into play. We'll submit the application. We don't wait for the analysts to reach out to us. We you know, give it a few days, contact the office, find out who our analyst was that was assigned, and then we proactively communicate with them so that we're getting our their questions answered. And there's always questions. Getting their answers, question, their questions answered, getting additional information submitted, uh, in a timely manner and trying to, you know, make sure that that's solidified before either the, the application and the project goes to, uh, in many of the cases, the Commonwealth Financing Authority, so that board and those four caucuses for consideration and vote, or in some cases, uh, DCED, DEP, DCNR have administrative funds uh, that they make decisions with staff. So, we'll, you know, we understand which programs are which and we make sure we make that outreach. Once a, a project is awarded, uh, we do uh, a lot of what we do actually is, is post award compliance. So, um, in fact, many have today or clients we have today started out as projects that had gotten in trouble in some way, shape, or form along the way, and it was stuck um, for whatever reason. It could be payroll compliance, prevailing mm -hmm. wage compliance. It could be steel. Uh, it could be bidding. It could be any number of things. You know, matching funds. <laughs> would refer them to us to, to step in and see if we could write the ship and handle that compliance. And then generally, once that happens, I can think of one client in particular started with, you know, one crisis compliance project. And now we've got, you know, eight different projects across Pennsylvania with this particular client. It's, it's probably been eight years now. So it's, it's one of those things that, you know, once you're able to, to solve that problem and demonstrate that there is a path forward and you can take that project through it, it, it tends to make the next couple of projects a little smoother so we will support all of that so uh the bidding process oh, go ahead no, no i was going to say thank you so much colleen i think you've given us a very comprehensive yeah. overview of what sure. you what you and econ partners do I, I think that my my first question i think you answered you cover soup to nuts you're you're identifying Absolutely. projects you're making the application you're also administrating the funding once it's received yeah. and then your and relationship as well yes so i'm going to open it up to the board um is there are there any questions from the remaining members of the board Okay. Um, is this a, a, a fee for service type of contract or based on the award uh, that they get? It's a, con it's a consulting agreement. It was in the manager's report. So the manager's report included the entirety of the consulting agreement, but it is a consulting agreement. Okay. Is, is there a, are there any statistics around success? I was asked that question recently last week, and I would say, and, and I'll answer it this way. No, I don't have an exact number, but I would say 
I would say that not everything is funded immediately the first time you submit, submit a second, sometimes a third time. It just depends on the program, how many applications there are, how, you know, where you are in line. Perhaps there was a project that was there two years ahead of you and that legislator needs to, you know, satisfy that priority. So ultimately, I think we're probably, I would say 92, 93% success rate, it's, it's high and it's high for a number of reasons. We were very careful uh, about the projects we take on. Um, we take a look at a number of things before we, um, you know, hopefully other, obviously other folks have to consider to bring us on. But it, as we're looking at projects, we're, we're pretty direct and say, we, we believe we can help you and it's a strong project and we believe it can be funded and here are the reasons. Uh, either the project hits stated priorities uh, we believe that you could have strong legislative support or the governor's office as you know, for example, workforce development is a huge priority for this governor. So depending on the type of project it is, we, you know, we, we give a pretty thorough recommendation on the onset and I think set realistic expectations for yes, this is a, you know, I've had to tell clients, you know, potential clients, no, we don't think we can help you. And I have to tell existing clients, you know, municipalities in some cases, you know, that's while I understand it's a priority project for you, it, it's not something that we think is going to score well. So let's maybe look at something else and, and reshape how we approach that. So I, I think we do a, a pretty good job of, of, of making that analysis ahead of time and we're tenacious. So if we don't you know, secure it the first time, we are back in that office, speaking to the analyst, speaking to the program director to say, you know, what happened? Was it just a case of you know, the project didn't meet requirements or didn't meet um, you know, quite the, the scoring level or the, the priority that the office put forth? Was there too much competition? Was there a legislative issue? It just wasn't a priority. Uh, so we make sure we identify what that issue is. And then if we have to take a different direction that with resubmission, we'll do that. Uh, are there other uh, sources of money that you would go after besides um, government uh, grants and uh, applications? Are there any... Uh, public sorry, uh, monies? Um, so we generally pursue just public funding. So whether that's, you know, on a county basis, it could be county based ARPA funding, for example. I know, um, you know, Montgomery County is about to open its RFP if it hasn't already today. I've been, I apologize, I've, I've been on the road, but uh, so we'll do anything from, you know, county based funding uh, through uh, federal funds as well, but it's generally all public funding. Occasionally, I mean, we have a number of nonprofit particularly arts and culture clients, we've done occasionally um, with, with one of our team members had a, a background in foundation grant writing, but it, it's not our wheelhouse and it's not something we typically do. Typically, the types of funds we, we seek are for capital costs, planning, um, or capital costs. So infrastructure, you know, roads and streets, public safety, uh, vertical construction, you know, public administration, facilities, public works, those types of things. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions from the board? Yeah, I have a question. Hi, Colleen, Kathleen Hunsaker, Hi. thanks for coming in. Oh, absolutely. Um, so we have a manager and an assistant manager. They're both salaried employees who heretofore have been writing our identifying grants, mm -hmm. writing the grants, doing the administration, basically doing what you're proposing to do for mm -hmm. us. And um, we also historically have had very good relationships with our state legislators in the House and the Senate who mm -hmm. also have helped us shepherd through the process and advocated for any applications that um, we decide to submit. And typically they are the state funds, DC, uh, DCNR, all the numbers, all the agencies that you- All the acronyms. Uh, ticked <laughs> off, as well as um, Montgomery County money. Um, $48,000 a year is a, is a significant budget item. And I'm wondering if you could speak to the value that you would add to what we currently have in place. Sure. Uh, so I, I start with that's tremendous, and I'm glad you have um, you know the manager and assistant manager that are assets in, in that regard and have the ability to to do that. Many townships or municipalities aren't as fortunate, so that's fantastic. Uh, so in terms of how we would, um, we have a number of clients that have staff that have historically you know written grant applications and, and had success. A number of ways we can be of value is free up, of course, um, you know their valuable time so that they can focus on uh, you know other aspects of running the township essentially. Uh, and often, um, you know, we find that we may be aware of either, you know, aspects of programs that, um, you know, different tweaks, for example, in, in the way that 
for example, multi multimodal or greenways trails, they might have a different focus that's not going to be published in updated guidelines. They might have a different priority or set of priorities for this year's funding that will, will able to be able to bring that information uh, to bear, essentially. Um, often we can uh, just add additional hours and add additional um, you know, expertise in, in subject areas that we have you know, quite a bit of experience in, depending on, on who's working on the grant application. Um, so we can add you know, things like you know, data sources that we know that a particular uh, program is looking for, a manager is looking for, and, and tying projects into that. Um, we can often identify funds that either folks aren't aware of or you know, in advance of them opening so that we've got you know, some window. In many cases, we know when things are, are going to open or new programs have come through the legislature and we can prepare our clients ahead of time. For example, local share was one of those. Um, you know, we had worked, uh, we actually um, had a role in advising, uh, you know, during the program, we had done a, a question and answer a number of times with the, the department and DCED and the community side that was going to launch the program and had gotten some, um, you know, not unofficial, but some calls to say, hey, you know, if we, if we took this program this direction, how do you think it would be received? Do you think it would be, you know, useful to municipalities, to nonprofits? And we've, you know, we're a source uh, of information and reference for the folks who are actually developing the guidelines, which, you know, is, is an opportunity. We, of course, we, you know, we took when when we had that. Uh, and so we we knew we followed it through the legislature, and we aware were aware of when the program was going to launch, and we were able to, in a number of cases, prepare folks, um, you know, for the eventuality this would be opening, and have them thinking about, you know, what are your priorities, uh, and and you know have some early conversations with some of the decision makers to, to say, you know, what are you thinking uh, for your district? What are you thinking are your priorities? What are you seeing as a community benefit project? Uh, and have those conversations early um, because we're, you know, aware or, or you know, have relationships with the folks that make those decisions. So that, that's often helpful. Um, and some, you know, again, with, with compliance and post award, particularly with RACP and, and Office of Budget, it changes every day. There's something, I learned something, been working with RACP for 20 years, but I learned something every day at the program that I didn't know before that they're looking at differently or handling differently than they had in the past. So having, you know, that's, uh, we found that invaluable for our RACP clients is having that, you know, relationship with the Office of Budget and knowing who, you know, who's handling scope review, who's handling pay, you know, pay request review, who's the final decision maker for things that uh, don't require legal determination, but require administrative determination and what's the, the cleanest path to, to get over that hurdle. So we can often, um, you know, create time where time, you know, doesn't, is a factor in being able to implement a project, we can expedite uh, and maybe cut through some of that, that red tape and hurdles. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you work Long with- answer, I apologize. No, that's, no, it's fine. Thank you. Um, you mentioned that you worked with Radnor for 20 years. Uh, are uh, they, no, uh, our office is, our office is in, in Radnor, but Radnor's not- Oh, I'm client. sorry. So we've, that's okay. That's quite all right. So can you name Rack some munis municipalities that are clients of yours? Sure. Um, so I spent the day in City of Coatesville. So City of Coatesville, has, uh, the city itself and its redevelopment authority have been clients for eight years. Um, Borough of Missing in Berks County, uh, Springfield Township, Aston Township in Delaware County, uh, East Penn, East Pennsboro in Cumberland County, uh, Cumberland County itself is a, a client through uh, KDIC, its Economic Development uh, Corporation and its IDA. Um, Borough of Oxford. Borough of Oxford has been a client for, I would say, nine, nine years, nine and a half years. Uh, and their Main Street, separately OMI, Oxford Main Street, uh, is also a client as well. Uh, West Whiteland Township in Chester County. Uh, West Nottingham Township in Chester County. Um, drawing a blank. That's certainly a, a healthy mix over the years. And we've had other municipal clients over the years, but those are, are certainly some of our current clients. Thanks, Colleen. You're welcome. Thanks for asking. Are there any other questions from the board? Is there any questions from the audience? Online? Oh, go ahead. I just need you to state your name and, and address, sir. Can you state your name and address? I think we, we have a microphone. So they can hear you online. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Dan Steinman, 800 Norris Town Road, Springhouse. Thank you, sir. Oh, I'll be quick questions. I, <laughs> I missed uh, 
coming in just a couple of questions. Uh -huh. Is your organization a 501c3? We are not. We're an S corporation. So we are we are for profit. And how do you arrange your charges to the township? Uh, there, uh, this proposal is proposed as a monthly retainer uh, with unlimited hours, um, which you know, in the case of particularly with municipalities, they like to know in, in our experience what to budget for uh, and how to plan. And in, in many cases, for example, in one of our municipalities uh, in March, we've got four different applications that are due. So that if we, for example, had to bill that at a monthly rate, uh, it just it wouldn't make fiscal sense for most oh, of our municipal you. or for-profit clients. Absolutely. Thanks for the question. That's all. Thank you. Is there any um, is there any questions online? Yeah. No. You good? Yeah. I can't read it. Okay. Okay. I thank you so much, Colleen, um, for taking thank the time out of your evening to come and talk to us and, and to present this proposal. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thanks so much. Have a good evening. You as Take well. Care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So we do have this presentation that we just received from Colleen. And before us, we have consideration for a proposal um, for Econ to assist in identifying funding sources for eligible products, projects. I don't know why I keep saying products. Um, is there a motion to consider? What do you mean consider? Consider the propo the, con the consulting to to proposal. Accept, but to vote on accepting her proposal that we have in the uh, yes. report? Yes. Um, or is there any other questions from the board? Uh, if we're, if this is something that we want to do, I think it would be prudent for us to look at other outfits that provide similar service. How, how is it that this particular company came to our awareness? Um, I think she approached, well, I know that she approached me. I don't know if she approached anybody else on the board. Um, she works in consultation with other entities um, and kind of just made me aware of their services. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm very much in favor and interested in this um, type of help. Uh, I consider it help for the, for the township. Um, but it might be reasonable to ask a couple of other companies to see what would you think? I think we should, we're obligated to do that. That's professional service, Neil? Yes. Yeah. So. Not necessarily, but this is something that we've never done in Lower Gwinnett Township. And I also think we need to quantify what um, Craig and Jamie are doing currently in terms of finding grant money, um, applying and success rate, et cetera, in terms of the money that we're getting and in terms of how much that if we can figure out the $4,000 per month versus what we're already getting through um, our salaried employees. In the last, in either last week or the week before his manager report, there was a list of the grants that we've applied for, had gotten and had not gotten. So that, I think that information has been compiled. Mm -hmm. It wasn't this manager's report. It was no, it was the, la it was the last or the week before. Yeah. Yeah, so, it's an Excel sheet, I think. Yeah. So yeah. it's in there. We have the data. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, Jamie and Craig, we don't administer the grants here, do we? We do, okay. So I think the uniqueness of the time that we're, we're operating in right now, and this is just from my perspective, is that um, due to the pandemic, due to the recovery that we're now in the midst of related to the pandemic, there's a significant amount of federal dollars, state dollars, money that's struggled from the federal government down to the state and thus to the county associated with that recovery process. These grants don't necessarily always, they're not always available. They're not annually available. And I think there's nuance to how they've changed this year. The local share grants an example, but um, the way that they're, that they're opening up kind of the doorways for that more opportunities so that more municipalities can take part in them. The issue that we have is historically, um, we haven't, ha we don't have an updated comprehensive plan. Our plan was updated in 2000. We are behind eight ball as it relates to a plan that we can actually 
project, the, these are the projects that we actually know we wanna do, and this is the timeline in which we wanna accomplish it. That would line up with the grant funding and that typically would make it easier for a township manager or system manager to, act, to apply, to administer, to execute a grant. Because we have not done that um, and the monies are there, we will miss out on the opportunities to apply for these grants. We will miss out on the opportunities if we spend a significant amount of time reviewing other, other potential entities. And, and I'm sure there are other entities out there, but if we spend a significant amount of time reviewing them, the opportunity to apply for these grants will be gone. And my, my reading of the contract, and Neil, you, you correct me if I'm wrong, but yeah. it, it is, the, the, the price is for a year, but we can terminate month, you know, within, we can just give 30 days notice. So we're not committed to a full year. That's correct. So in, in all actuality, this could be somebody that, that we use for a short period of time as it relates to a short period of grants. Um, and then during that period of time, we have the opportunity to evaluate anybody else moving forward, anyone else more long-term or to address, I mean, there's other things on our agenda that could kind of correlate with this, with this proposal or this um, agreement, but for us to actually project what we want to accomplish within the next few years. The only concern that I have is that once this time period ends that we're recovering from the pandemic and these grant opportunities are here, the money will go away with it. And we, again, our poor planning, which I know we can't, couldn't have foresight that we're gonna enter in a pandemic, but here we are now. Our poor planning as it related to projecting what we knew we were gonna need for Lower Gwinnett or how we wanted Lower Gwinnett to look five, 10, 20 years down the line puts us in a position where we are not agile enough to be able to, to just apply for these grants. We don't have the paperwork, we don't have the narrative, we don't have the projects, we're not shovel ready. I mean, that's just case in point. And it would be undue burden, I believe, to put this on Craig and Jamie while also running the township. So what, oh, sorry, Greg. What, what are our legal obligations then of um, comparing? We have none, because it's a, it's a professional service. services contract. Oh. So you don't go out the bid. Okay. So, so I, I would be in favor of moving forward with this. I, I, I think that because of the nuances that you just mentioned and um, having somebody who's already really enmeshed and, and immersed in the uh, ins and outs of this new money coming from the federal government, I think it would be uh, an advantage for us to use somebody that already um, is tuned in uh, with what is required for the grant money. Um, and I, I agree, it, it may just be a short-term um, requirement that we have. It, it shouldn't last for years or months even. No, that, I don't think that's the intention, at least from my perspective. Is there, are there any other questions from the board? Is there questions from, are there questions from the audience? I saw a hand. That's the appropriate sign. <laughs> you could just come up and use the microphone because the online, they can't hear you. You said your name and address. Gregory Harth, 230 Mathers Road in Ambler, um, technically Bluebell, I guess. Um, as a business owner in the area, these types of investments that you guys are challenged to making are oftentimes, um, the question is, do you try to find the grant first and then fill out the paperwork or do you, do you hire somebody to go out and get the sales and create these opportunities? It would behoove the township to hire a professional like this to start scratching and clawing for these things because there's just a windfall of cash out there that you guys can put into place a lot of things a lot faster than waiting to evaluate two or three more, um, more for $4,000 a month and then you can terminate any time. Seems like an easy decision. One thing I'll note is um, Craig, Craig was able to put together um, a pretty comprehensive spreadsheet of the grants that we've applied for and um, gotten and not gotten over the past mm, three, four years? Uh, probably five years. Five years. Um, and it looks like seven grants were denied. And I'm sure it was absolutely not for a lack of trying, but I think one of the things that will help is if we have somebody who's in that world and maybe it, maybe we have better success. It's, I think to everyone's point, there's just a bunch of money out there and we're gonna lose it if we don't try to get it. 
And, and, and in all honesty, it's our own tax dollars. They're coming back to us. I think Lower Gwinnett deserves it more than any other municipality, at least as much as any other municipality. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we have the consulting agreement in front of us. Um, if, if there's not any more questions, is there a motion to move I just forward? have one more question. Oh, go ahead. Um, do, does uh, Colleen Econ come to the Board of Supervisors for authorization to submit each grant that they identify? Each grant, I think that's within the, the agreement, but I do believe yes. I mean, I'd, we'd have to pass a resolution to each time. Anyway. So that, each so time. So they, they don't would, have discretion. No, they don't have carte blanche to just move forward without our authorization, no. But it's, it's outlined in the agreement. I'll, that, I'll move to retain econ. Is there a second? If I could just you have add question? an addendum to the motion that we um, review performance every three or six months or monitor it. Okay. Yeah. I have sure, no issue with will, that. Yeah, Which one is it? There's no question about that. Three? Three months, every three months. Okay. Okay. I'll second that with the addendum. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We have retained econ. Um, and next we'll go on to our regular business and finance, a receipt of the minutes um, for February 14th. Has everyone had a chance to look at those minutes? Yes. Yeah. Is there any issues, questions, or concerns? Are there any questions from the public? Is there a motion to accept the minutes? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Minutes have been accepted. Um, there is a receipt of the invoice history for January 2022. Have, have everyone on the Board of Supervisors had a chance to look at that? Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Are there any questions? No. Are there any questions from the public? All those in favor? Um, or is there a motion to, to accept the receipt of the invoice history for January 2022? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? We've accepted um, the invoice history for January 2022. Uh, before us is a consideration of a proposal for e-collect to perform auditing of the business privilege tax in Lower Gwinnett Township. Um, we have had uh, e-collect, I think, two meetings ago, and I can't say the date. Is it January, January 14th? 14th. 14th? February 14th. Uh, no, 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 I know. No, no, no. no, no. 30th. January. They came out in January to present the information about their business and to kind of make us aware of, of their auditing services. We've had subsequent informational gathering sessions with both eCollect and Berkheimer. And we had a number of questions at our, our last meeting that we answered, I think, in those informational sessions. So we have before us a consideration of proposal for eCollect to perform auditing of BPT in Lower Gwinnett Township. Are there any questions from the board? Are there any questions from the audience or the public? I, I actually do have a question okay. and this is kind of maybe off the wall, but um, would, would eCollect also evaluate the bills that we're getting like from PICO? This came up in the energy committee meeting um, in case we're being overbilled. They're it's only the yeah. business privilege tax. I don't think they do that type of auditing. Yeah. I mean, they're not in, they don't audit for anything. Um, I, there are companies that'll do that yeah. kind of audit, um, but that's not e-collect. Okay. Yeah. It'd be good to get a twofer, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> nah, this is just, hopefully they can find us the money that's owed and bring it back to the township. Okay. Very good. Any question from the public? Is there a motion to move forward with um, the proposal for ECLEC to perform auditing of the BPT in, in Lower Gwinnett? I actually have a question, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Um, for our solicitor, yeah. did we work it out with Berkheimer that they'll give up their exclusive rights to do that? I prepared an amendment to the agreement. They have it and they're looking at it, but they have not signed it yet. So anything we approve is contingent on that. Absolutely. Okay. So I, I guess with that contingency that uh, I'll move to retain um, e-collect, assuming that 
Berkheimer releases its exclusivity on the business privilege tax collection. Is there a second? I'll second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it does pass. We have accepted e-collect to perform auditing of BPT and lower going to township contingent upon the agreement of Berkheimer, Berkheimer releasing their exclusivities. Yes. Um, next is uh, building and zoning. Um, this is the request for additional waiver of sidewalk for the Goddard School. I think we have council. Good evening, Elena Baylerian on behalf of Beth Pike LLC. Um, since we were here last time, I don't know if the, the board already has this, but our engineers had a chance to talk to the townships engineers. Mm -hmm. And I do have with me letters from both your traffic engineer and townships engineer with no objection to our requested partial waiver of the ordinance. Um, I see not, so <laughs> I don't know that I need to make for the presentation. I will introduce my client who is a resident of the township who is here with me, um, but I would request our partial waiver of the 1230.45 um, uh, ordinance regarding the sidewalk in front of Beth Pike. I thank you for returning and I thank you for your patience with us. I, I have a question. It. Go ahead. And it's not about the crosswalk because it's okay with those guys it's probably okay with me um I, I, I have a question about the sketch plan um and before i had this auspicious job i was on the planning commission so i'm familiar with this what does that sketch plan demonstrate because it, it it shows something that I was worried about when this came before the planning commission, I think, which is somebody making a right out of Goddard and somebody making a left out of. The beverage, yeah, I wasn't going to say the beverage place. It gives me a bad look. But um, like Vic Sushi. Yeah. So what I, that's my question about this sketch plan. Why, what, what is this showing? Um, no, this isn't the plan. It's attached to the, I think it's the traffic planning. That one. Yes, yeah. that one. Yes. So this is showing and I, uh, the radius required. So you have our driveway on the left and you have the beverage entities uh, driveway on the right. The sidewalk area that had been in question is essentially where those, the blue arrow on the left would have been. There would have been um, a small piece of sidewalk there um, sort of bridging between the two driveways. Instead, there would be no sidewalk there so that there is a full ability for the radius of the cars to be able to have that space and have more ability to right. turn. So they can do a tighter turn. That, that's what it's right. Okay, so without, so no one has to go up on the sidewalk or the curb or whatever it is and that, so just the crosswalk of And of I, I, I air to the engineers that I've correctly <laughs> analyze the, the drawings, but that is my understanding that it, it would just have, there would, essentially it is exactly as it exists today with the exception of a painted crosswalk. Um, the ordinance would have had us put in a small sort of means of egress or a spot in the middle, um, but there wouldn't have been ability to turn. That would, that would be if it was the Correct. original proposal, the curve came up to the Forgive me, I forget, you know, all the details of the of the plans that you've submitted and been approved, but there's lighting across the front of your property. There will be lighting across the front. Or, okay, because I, I think it, you can even see it. Yeah. Okay. So I, my point is the you'll be able to see the crosswalk. It'll be clear that there's a crosswalk there, even at night. I believe it shows a light post right at the edge of the okay. sidewalk where the um, curb cut would be. And I think that's one indicated on the other side there as well. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. 
Thank you. Are there any other questions from the board? Are there any questions from the public? Is there any online? No. no. I appreciate your time. So in front of us, we have consideration for the waiver of the sidewalk for the Goddard School. Do I have a, move, a motion? So moved. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Next, we have the request to authorize um, an addendum to our side in the ordinance. Um, one second. So this is, is related to um, the Lower, Lenin, Lower Gwinnett Little League um, and the ability for the Little League to place um, advertising signs in their outfield along the outfield um, wall. Um, the Little League um, is in need of opportunities or the possibility to be able to raise funding. Um, just for, for them to keep on going and for them to have opportunities for, for all of our, our youth to be able to participate in Little League, honestly. Um, I don't know if everyone else has had children go through baseball, but I have, and it is costly. Um, it is not what it used to be. Um, so Lower Gwinnett Little League is asking or requesting um, changes to our side norms to allow them to place signs in the outfield. Um, this and I don't know if you guys can see it, this ordinance kind of is the, the entirety of it. Um, so it would be a change to our um, zoning to add the new 12910 to be entitled Seasonal Little League Sponsorship Signs, which will allow the Lower Gwinnett Little League um, Township Little League to erect certain sponsorship signs at the township's own field subject to certain terms and conditions. Um, this is just to advertise for that ordinance. We have circulated this ordinance prior to this advertisement to our Park and Rec Board, to um, our own Planning Commission, and to the Montgomery County Planning Commission. And they've all come back with suggestions and recommendations, which we have included in, in this proposed advertisement. Um, is there any questions from, or are there any questions from the board? Are there any questions from the public? Yes, Lynn Smith, 507 Hobby Horse. Thank what you. kind of signs are these? Are they electronic or are they standard? No, signs? They're not electronic signs. They're the signs, essentially, if you look, if you drive past Ingersoll Field, there are signs um, already uh, that adorn some of the cages, um, not advertisements, but signs for past championships or past performance for the Little League. It'd be signed similar to that. The ordinance provides that they can't be higher than the outfield fence. It sets forth a certain size of the signs. Um, so they would not be electronic, no. Okay, and they would only be up during baseball season? Yes, but that being said, I think the thing that most people probably should understand is baseball season is not um, the spring anymore. It is the spring, the summer, fall ball. I mean, I think it's gonna be a nine months a year type thing. Okay, I would just hope that it wouldn't um, litter the neighborhood. I'm not sure what you mean by litter. The well, signs, will be, the signs well, will be there, they won't be able to come down. They'll be attached to the outfield wall. Right, well, I mean, take away from the charm of the neighborhood. I know it's a baseball field. I, 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 I did not like when the electronic signs went up at the Baptist church. So that's what I'm concerned about that it would change the nature of the neighborhood. Understood, they will not be electronic signs but I understand the question, thank you. Okay. And I do understand it's longer than just the spring so it seems to me that the signs would be up pretty much 12 months out of the year. So what's the point of taking them down for a few months? That may, that may be how it works in practice, to be honest with yeah. you. I just don't know, just given baseball has sort of expanded beyond one season. Right. So is your hope then that by collecting this advertising money that you would reduce the fees for the kids to play baseball? Is that the objective? 
We don't, we don't actually collect any money. This is for the lower Gwinnett Little League. And right, Texas. right, right. So is that their objective is to lower the cost for the kids to play? I don't know if that's entirely their objective. They have some ambitious projects that they would like to undertake at some of the fields, including bringing um, restroom facilities to some of the um, to some of the fields, that, which is very expensive. Right, and that would be expensive. They want the opportunity to try to raise money to be able to do those things. And and the one thing that I think um, shouldn't be lost here is that we're one of the very few municipalities that don't have this type of advertising on their outfield walls. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Are there any additional comments? Okay. Deborah, you see your name and your address? Yeah, this is Deborah Schaefer at 823 Penland Pike. Um, just for clarification, are these the signs, um, like the ones that are at the, uh, the baseball fields of the high school? I, I, don't, I believe they would be similar. Yeah, they do have signs in the outfield. I don't, I don't, that I don't know. I don't know if they're going to be the exact same thing, but I don't know somewhere. if they're going to be the exact same thing, but Deborah and Lynn as well. Um, we did the best we could in the ordinance to, um, you know, make the signs uniform in terms of size and color. They'll be facing inward towards the ball field, not outward towards the street. We did the best we could without running afoul of First Amendment restrictions. Um, so your concerns are our concerns too. And I think they've been well addressed in this ordinance. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions? I have uh, oh. one comment. Gloria has a question. Was there another question on there? There is. You, you want to go first? Uh, no, no, go ahead. Okay. Ms. Jones? You have to unmute. I don't know how, to, is that okay? Yeah, that's go. fine. Okay. Um, Gloria Jones, uh, 1007 Persian Road, Penland, PA. Um, my children were in uh, Penland baseball and I am very much for the baseball league. However, I feel that some consideration should be given to the fact that there was a neighborhood here before Little League. And I think some considerations should be given to how the Little League uh, baseball will affect our neighborhood. And I think that maybe you should give uh, some more consideration to the type of, of signs that you in, intend to put there. But like I said, um, I believe in the Little League baseball but I also believe in the community that uh, we should have an opportunity to make sure that we are not overwhelmed in the summertime by Little League Baseball. And I thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts. Thank you, Ms. Jones. Do you wanna? Well, I'm not, I guess I'm not the sure. signs will all be inward facing. So it's, you won't, you won't see the signs in the neighborhoods in, they'll be facing in towards home plate. Um, as far as consideration, I'm not necessarily sure I understand what you mean, but if you mean the, the content of the signs, the first amendment doesn't, and I don't wanna step on Neil's toes here, but uh, <laughs> the first amendment doesn't allow us to regulate based on content or viewpoint. We can regulate based on time, place, and manner as long as it's neutral principles, but we can't regulate content. So we couldn't say you can only have this sign, but you can't have that type of sign. Um, the one thing I will tell you is in the conversations that I've had with the Little League, this as, as easily, and I, I sort of say easily tongue in cheek because my oldest son is 22 and we've been looking to do this since he played Little League. 
So it hasn't been all that easy to get to this point, but as easily as the um, authority to grant signs was given is as easily as it could be taken away. So it will be incumbent upon the Little League to use its best discretion in the signs that they choose to put up. I don't know if that answered your question. Does that answer it, Ms. Oh, I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. Um, as far as it goes, it answers my question. Okay. But it doesn't answer my question in terms of impact on a neighborhood. And I don't know how that could be resolved, but yeah. I was just asking if some consideration and some thought would be given to it. You're talking about the larger idea of baseball in Penland's neighborhood? Yeah, I'm talking about the, the, the whole <laughs> impact, but uh, signs just seems like another thing <laughs> to impact on the neighborhood. And, and that's, a, I don't know anything about legal thing in, in <laughs> reference to that, but I, I'm just thinking of a, about the impact it has had on our neighborhood. That's all. I appreciate the comment. Thank you so much. Is there any other comment from the... Oh, Tessie. Yeah, I, I think you actually answered. Um, I, I thought there was a concern at some point about uh, political signs versus um, signs for restaurants or et cetera. But if that is um, running afoul of the First Amendment, then, then we can't resolve Yeah, we have to be very careful in that regard. OK. So this is just for the advertisement or the authorization to advertise the amendment to our sign ordinance um, from March 14th, 2022. Do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 We have um, approved the authorization for the advertisement of the addendum to our sign ordinance from March 14th, 2022. Um, next up, Brookside Avenue resident request for update on, on the flood study. Um, I'm gonna ask our engineer. Jim? Yeah, thank you. Uh, so some of the neighbors in Brookside are, have questions and concerns as to where we are with that process, what that process looks like, and an outline of maybe how the time, how they can anticipate it moving forward. Sure. So I think the last time I was in front of you uh, to give an update on this was in January, and I had highlighted that we were waiting on FEMA's, uh, we were waiting on FEMA to get back to us on giving the their flood data and their flood study that they had uh, conducted to generate the, the floodplain. Um, we received that information last week. Uh, I wasn't really able to delve too deep into it, but I was uh, able to take a look at it uh, very briefly, and that'll allow us to decide where we want to do some more detailed targeted survey. Mm -hmm. So the uh, next step is to mobilize survey and uh, have that stuff done. I would think in the next month we would be able to do that, and then you know probably uh, maybe a month after that is the, the analysis period and then i think we're on track to i had mentioned wanting to wrap this up in the first half of this year so we're, we're still on track for that certainly okay so you receive the data from fema you do a survey that takes approximately a month and then you do the analysis we're, we're thinking what is this we're going to say this is march so we're April. April, yeah, May. I would say if we could, um, if I could at the end of April give another update, I would have a lot more information than I have now. Okay, so I know that some of the, the residents are just concerned about, you know, this is the time of year where it does rain. Sure. Um, and we're going to probably be, hopefully not, hopefully not. But there, there could probably be potentially more incidents of, of flooding. And, and it's not just... It's not just related to Brookside. Actually, I think some people have reached out to me and let me know that on Francis and other surrounding streets that they've had some issues and impacts. Um, so all of that, I just want to ensure that all of that's going to be incorporated in, in some of the analysis that you're going to be doing. Yeah, I mean, I, generally the channel that runs from the railroad track up to the dam at the um, school district's property and everything that drains to that is, is in the scope. Okay. Of, of the study. It's not, it's not Fran Francis is w one, one or two over, over from Brookside. One street over. One street over. So yeah, yeah that, that would definitely be. It. So I think flooding from Brookside has gone into neighbors' backyards on Francis. That's really what uh, I think it is amounted to. 
Um, sure. So once you come back in April, we'll have a better understanding of where we are. And do you think that they'll be able to be at that point of determination as to any source or not quite? Is that ambitious to ask? Um, I think that the scope of this is to build a model of, of the existing situation and then try to decide whether or not it, certain improvements can have a, a measurable impact on m making that, that flooding better. Okay. So, I mean, that's, that's my end goal. I don't know that I'm gonna be able to have a solution uh, to you because I don't know that one exists, exists but. So is it, is it reasonable to assume that at the end of this study that we'll have an idea of what the source of the, of the problems with the excess water coming onto residential streets would be? Or is that, oh, and where, you know, on what property that source is coming from, or is that unrealistic? I think that we would have an idea of where the pinch points are that are creating the flooding on the residential streets. Okay. Certainly, yeah. Okay. And it's impossible, given the scope of the study, to figure out where upstream it's coming from basically well, i can tell yeah i mean i can tell you where it's coming from and it's a uh, hundred plus yeah, it's acres nice. of various yeah. development you know it's not just it's not coming from the school district it's not coming from right. you know i mean it that drainage area is all the way across bethlehem pike in those neighborhoods that uh aileen and I mean, that's where it start, kind of starts. So that's at. that's what I was wondering. Like you, you can say, like it's because of the development that's on the other side of Bethlehem Pike, whether yeah. it be Mike's neighborhood or um, I'm joking. <laughs> I'm sorry, um, <laughs> or, or any other neighborhood um, that has erected and caused those downstream to be impacted. I mean, so it's not just like one thing. It's not. It's a it's a multitude of compounding factors that are now resulting in increased flooding yes there's there won't be a verdict in this where i say it's this person's fault or it's okay. this entity's fault even though we know it's mike's <laughs> <laughs> i appreciate that um i know that is it, are there any other questions from the any other member of the board i don't want to I, I i guess i will i don't want to make you look predict the future but do you ultimately we need to figure out solutions forget about where it came from it ultimately i mean i mean part of the solution might be where it comes from but you feel confident that once we get all the data back that there will be some suggestions for solutions there will definitely be suggestions for solutions it's just a matter of whether or not those solutions make a measurable enough impact that you all deem it economically feasible okay oh gotcha. okay yeah. Um, it's gonna be a dredging project. Yeah. Are there are there any other questions from the board? Are there any questions? I know that we have members um, in person and online from Brookside. Do you have any other? You want to come and have? Mr. Murray, there, just if you could just say your name and, and um, your address. Could you pass us around to the board members and the uh, monitor. Please? <laughs> Appreciate you, Jim. Thanks. <laughs> Mr. Murray, I don't want to interrupt you Thank while you're you. speaking. So Thank can you. you make sure that you talk into the microphone just so everybody at home sure. can hear you? Sure. Thank you. Yes, I'd like to. I'm uh, William Murray. I live at uh, 413 Brookside Avenue. Um, oh my God, oh my God. Sure. William Murray, you got it? Yeah. There you go. Um, I, what, William Murray, for. <laughs> What's happening? That's why I have to speak louder. Okay, oh. William Murray, I live at 413 Brookside Avenue. Um, I'm uh, part of the uh, Brookside Avenue neighbors. And I'd like to uh, read a statement which uh, we prepared. It says, uh, Board of Supervisors, the Brookside Avenue neighbors would like to be a partner in finding solutions to the flooding on Brookside Avenue. We know it will be a long journey, the first step taken, the flood mitigation study. However, our future input and sharing strategy is vital because of our lives and homes are dependent upon it. Who but the residents know the flood conditions of the neighborhood? 
A perfect example of cooperation occurred on October 19, 2021 between neighbors, business, school board, and township. A dozen residents, two representatives from Amber Yard, school board secretary and township manager and engineer came to work together. Let us not clean the culverts of debris after flooding has occurred while voices be heard. Be proactive, include everybody directly impacted by flooding on Brookside Avenue. And uh, this could be done by notifying all the 21 residents of Brookside Avenue by mail, future meetings, time and place. My, uh, the gist of my concern is that uh, we, we are directly impacted by this uh, flooding and that uh, we have a voice in the matters that are being discussed uh, by the engineer and uh, township school board and uh, we can become part of the process. Absolutely. No, I think as things, and I think that's what Jim was kind of speaking to at this today. At, at this point, we're kind of in the preliminary steps of he just received the FEMA information. He's now kind of analyzing that information and what that looks like as far as a period of time that he needs to analyze. And then the next step is the study. And the next step is that he would be able to come back to us. Potentially he's giving us April, but we'll say at the very latest May to give us a report as to what he's able to not just surmise, but through his um, experience and um, expertise can, can tell us as far as what are the pinch points is, that are causing the increase in flooding. It's not specific to one thing, and that's what we were kind of extrapolating from our conversation before. It's not one specific thing. I know that it would be much easier if we can point our finger at somebody and say, you've caused this, um, but it seems like it might be a history of a development that didn't exist previously, that has increased over you know period of 10, 20 years potentially, and now is impacting us in a way that the flooding is, is now uncontrollable or at least not manageable. Um, and then, you know, we hope that he's going to be able to provide us solutions so that we can address or figure out how we could potentially address it and, and, and then make decisions moving forward. So at that point of the analysis and, this, and the information being gathered, 1000%, we're going to be at the table as far as stakeholders and we're directly impacted. You know, we're property owners as well as there's businesses that are affected. Um, but residentially, you know, we're all, we're all impacted, you know, tremendously. Almost each time it rains, we're concerned. Um, so I, I don't think there's any way that we could not be a part of the conversation, but I'm here to let you know that you will be. Okay, that's uh, all that we're asking for. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions from online? Okay. Okay. Cynthia, could you just say your uh, name and address? I think you might have to unmute. Can you hear us, Cynthia? Uh, okay, the unmute, uh, I'm unmuted now. There you go. Just say your name and address. Okay, I'm Cynthia Best and I live at 420 Brookside Avenue. And I would just like the person who goes and does this evaluation to please look at that big cement bridge at the top of the street. I've been here in this neighborhood for 40 years, actually over 40 years, and it hits that bridge, the big cement bridge, and it pops out into the street. So um, it's, it's always flooded our street, you know, so I just would like it if they would look at that. And I think that that would just be part of a simple solution to remove that, or if they don't want to remove it, they could do a metal one across, you know, um, instead of that big cement uh, glob that really does clog things up. And it pushes all kinds of debris into the street and the township comes and cleans it up every time, but it's getting more and more dangerous more and more dangerous. So please look into that. Cynthia, are you talking about, you're talking about the bridge that's connected to the property on Marion Avenue? I am. Okay. So I think we were aware that, and I, our solicitor has kind of shared correspondence with that neighbor to let them know that that is against our zoning ordinance. However, we have not moved forward with uh, addressing or requesting any immediate removal because of the need for the study. I mean, there's the potential that removing that bridge would ultimately 
and I'm not an engineer, but I believe that it, it could, in the event of a flood moving forward, just basically flood Amber Yards, essentially. Um, and we wouldn't want that to happen. Not that, not saying that the what's happening right now is okay, but that's the reason for the study. That's to actually find the source of the problem as opposed to addressing one of the effects that we're feeling, you know, personally and, and you know, through our, you know, through our property. So again, the, the purpose of the study is for him to actually look at the, the larger issues, the root causes as it relates to why the flooding is happening in the first place. And then as it relates to is, is the dam impacted and, and is the dam being impacted affecting the water and then is the water impacted causing it to rush at a high level down our street, down the bridge, hit it and cause debris to flood, flood our street. So it's, it's not just a, we're not looking for a simple short-term solution that could potentially cause other problems. We're kind of looking for the root cause issue so that we can address it um, more strategically. Does that make sense? Yeah, but we okay. might not be able to do anything. We might not be able to do anything about alien development, so. No, absolutely, I absolutely. But there could hopefully, hopefully be some solutions that he can present to us to resolve the issue as it relates to what we currently are dealing with. Obviously we can't tear down all the houses on Aileen. Absolutely. But, um, but I mean, like, I, I think what the hope is and what the goal is, is that he can prevent, he can provide us with solutions to mitigate some of the problem that we're faced with currently. Okay. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? No, thank you. Okay. If there's no other questions um, from the audience, I think we'll move on. Um, and thank you. Thank you, Jim. Um, the next thing under consideration is um, local share grant application for the rehab of Old Bethlehem Pike Culvert. I believe, do you wanna talk about this, um, Craig? Sure. So I, I know that there's a, a new grant opportunity that's been made available. And I think one of our previous presenters touched on it. It's a local share grant um, that historically is proceeds from gambling monies, essentially, um, that now is made available to municipalities in, in larger or more open um, application process where there isn't strict guidelines. Um, so you can kind of yeah, so um, we looked at the, the grants. Um, Jamie put that Excel sheet together that Mike, you talked about um, a, a little while ago. Um, one of the um, opportunities that we're looking at is uh, the culvert at Old Bethlehem Pike, which is behind uh, the township building here, uh, looking to rehab that culvert. And we thought the local shares grant from DCED would be a, uh, hopefully a good match. Um, so we're, this is just a resolution for us to submit um, a grant application in the amount of $786,000 for um, rehabbing that culvert behind the uh, township on Old Bethlehem Pike. Um, I just have a quick question, Craig. Is our estimate of the 786 still pretty solid? I mean, I, it, was it a while ago that we got the 786 number? And I know costs of everything have gone up. Yes, we re looked at that uh, that number, and we're uh, we're pretty cons uh, pretty certain that that is uh, correct at this point too. Great, thank you. Do we have a match? Uh, local sir, uh, share grant does not have a match. Um, so I know that the the information regarding the grant and then the application, I think, were included in the manager's report. Are there any other questions from the board? Are there any questions from the public? Um, I think okay. Okay. Um, seeing no other questions, um, is there a motion to move forward with, with the submission of, and we don't have a resolution number, but the resolution to authorize submission of the local share grant application for the rehab of the Old Bethlehem Pike Culver? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Motion passed. Um, there is nobody else. Yeah, a motion passed. We are approved the submission of local share grant application for the rehab of the Old Bethlehem Pike culvert. Next is the submission for the uh, Monco 2040 application for the installation of the pedestrian bridge on the western side of Bethlehem Pike across the stream. I don't know if it's Craig or Jamie. Do you, do you want to talk about this again? Um, it would be the same. Um, this is a Monco 2040 grant. We're looking at for $200,000. 
Um, there is a match of 20%, but we're looking at a 30% match. $200,000 is the max for the, uh, the grant. Um, this would be very similar to the, the grant we received from Mongo 40 for the, um, I guess, east side northbound um, pedestrian bridge that we are working on now. Um, that would be right after Bergie's on the Wawa side of Bethlehem Pike. This particular grant um, in front of you tonight is for the west, uh, west side, western side southbound from Springwood Association to, um, it used to be the Knopf Dodge, now it's being used by Bergie's on the opposite side of Wawa. <laughs> Everyone knows where Wawa is. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> Everything revolves around Wawa. But, um, so we're just looking for another submission to Monco 40 for $200,000 grant with a 30% match. Um, all this information was included in the manager part. Are there any questions from the board? Yeah. Uh, do we have a, a diagram or what is it we're paying for? A, a pedestrian bridge over the creek. Yeah, but I haven't seen any pictures, diagrams, illustrations, dimensions. Will it be okay, just can, like the one across the street? Basically, it's I mean, going to be exactly like yeah. the one across the street and the one on Welsh Road that we put in. If you want to actually see something in person, you can see the one on Welsh Road um, near Landfair and Lloyd between those two. The one at Gwinnett Hunt is another one uh, that crosses the bridge. Okay. Um, is, is this wide enough for two people to walk side by side? Oh, more than that. It's, it's much wider. It it's depends like how big the people are. <laughs> 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 yes, yeah, yeah, so I think it's six foot wide, Jim. <coughs> yep, I believe it's six foot wide. Okay, so somebody with a baby buggy could yes. easily go across it. Okay, yes. that's, that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. We, Janine and I actually crossed it with uh, her son Sam in the stroller. It's the one on um, Beth Pike. So yeah, he made it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And we could get the diagram and um, a photo of the a similar bridge in the packet for this week. Okay. Are there any other questions from the supervisor? Other questions from the um, public? This is, okay, there's nobody online. So this is um, to submit the Monco 2040 application for installation of pedestrian bridge on the Western side of Bethlehem Pike across from the stream. Um, is there a motion to approve? I move. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion carries. We're approving the Monco 2040 application for the installation of pedestrian bridge on the Western side of Bethlehem Pike across from the stream. Um, this is for consideration of the um, Penn ENR um, proposal for 901 Semitown Pike to provide additional sampling and a final act to close out report. I believe this information was included in the manager's report, but Craig, do you want to speak to it? Sure. Uh, 901 Semitown Pike is the corner of um, well, Semitown and Bethlehem Pike across the street here where the new shopping center is, um, where you see Arpeggio. Uh, the township used to own that corner. Um, went out for a sale of this lot in 2017. It was um, purchased by the Springhouse Village Association. And um, with the agreement was that we would do a cleanup of the, um, of the uh, parcel at that time. Um, so we've been going through the environmental cleanup and this is hopefully the last stage we uh, submitted back in, uh, well, actually March of 2020, what we thought was the final report. Um, they came back and um, DEP came back, I'm sorry, and asked us to do a um, soil vapor sample of these three locations that are on the, the screen right now. So this proposal by Penn Environmental and Remediation is for $14,900 to do a vapor soil sample. In these three locations, they have to do it at two different times. So they will do this twice. Um, 
And what they explained, how they explained it is basically like a radon test for, uh, for a home, if you ever had that done. Um, so they'll do that, they'll write their final report, they'll submit it to DEP. They're pretty confident that um, there won't be any more um, studies that had to be done or anything, and that we can close this out for an act two uh, uh, release. I just had one question. There's a, so the cost of this seems to be $14,900. Do we budget in any way for this or do we anticipate this? Every year this has been in with the engineering, the general engineering fees, okay. because this has been this has been going on for a while. So. Okay. Okay. Are there any other questions from the board? Questions from the public? Anything online? Yeah. Okay, so this is um, consideration of the Penny and R proposal for 901 Summit Town Pike to provide additional sampling and a final act to close out report. Is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Passes. Consideration of the Penny and R proposal for the 901 Summit Town Pike to provide additional sampling and final act to close out. Next is the request to authorize to advertise RFPs for the roof and gutters at Ingersoll House and Barn, which is 1120 Old Bethlehem Pike, and the McCormick House, which is 409 Old Penland Pike. Um, I know that these items are in our budget, but do you want to speak any further to this, Craig? Um, yes, this is just in the budget. We just wanted to get moving on this if the board is uh, inclined to do so. Um, both properties, the McCormick piece down on um, Penland, uh, Old Penland Pike and the McCormick House behind us here, are both in need of roofs and McCormick definitely, or um, Ingersoll definitely need gutters. We're not sure about McCormick, but we would like to go out and uh, seek bids for uh, doing both projects at the same time. So, so the only question I have is, is specifically related to the McCormick House. I know that it's going to potentially be incorporated in a, a planning study, that's the next item on the agenda. Um, so is there any cost associated with us seeking this RFP? Because if so, you know, if, if different recommendations are made as a result of anything else that we're doing, um, I don't want us to unnecessarily waste money, essentially. Yeah, there's, there, there wouldn't be any cost with the uh, going out for an RFP. We would have to write the RFP that we can, you know, each would be a separate line item. The, okay roof for Ingersoll, the gutters for Ingersoll and the roof for McCormick. So it would be three different projects that we can eliminate one if we, if, if it comes in too high or if we decide not to do it. Okay. The, um, but we would have to do some kind of repair down at McCormick um, just because we are having some leakage. So is there, there's like- Intrusion of water into okay. the house. I don't wanna yes. say flooding, but okay. No, no, it's- is the building empty now? Uh, the, the houses, yes, the residences. Okay. Not the garages. So are they going to assess the need for roof and or gutters on both structures or we've decided that we want to replace both already? Both are in need of a new roof, yes. We've okay. already determined that, okay. yes. Are there any questions from the board? So we can write the RFP, as I said, stated with three different line items and that we can pull one out if, or pull all three out if we want, but. Yeah, okay. okay. I appreciate that. Are there questions from the public? The, the only thing I would add for McCormick House is if, and I don't know if you put this in the RFP or if it's just something you discussed with them, but you know, the cost to replace the roof first, maybe just put a Band-Aid on it while we're assessing what we're gonna do, I think would be helpful to know as well. Um, because if there is leakage right now that we want to remediate, um, you know, we may want to understand what that option is as opposed to just replacing the whole roof. Is there, is there damage incurred to the home at this point? Some inside damage to drywall and so forth. Is it, have we gone through insurance in any way? We have or not. Or is it, is it just wear? I think it's deterioration. Oh, no, okay. wear and tear, gotcha. That's what you do when you buy it as is. Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? So this is for a request to authorize advertisement of an RFP for the roof and gutters at Ingersoll House, the barn at 1120 Old Bethlehem Pike and McCormick House at 409 Old Bethlehem Pike. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Okay. All those in favor say aye. Aye. 
So we have approved the request to authorize the, the RFP for roof and gutters at Ingersoll House and Barn and the McCormick House. Next up is the consideration of the Gilmore proposal for Lower Quinnis Strategic Park Planning Project. Um, Jim, do you want to get up and tell us a little bit about it? Or you can sit, it's perfectly fine. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> no problem. So uh, in front of you is a proposal from my office to perform uh, strategic planning related to your parks and recreation system. Uh, just a kind of a brief overview of, of the scope. So there's five township parks and uh, we would do site visits to all of those as well as conducting uh, key person interviews. Um, anticipated uh, individuals for the key person interviews, uh, parks and recreation director, township manager, and then any other key individuals as designated by your uh, parks and rec uh, subcommittee of your board. Um, so we would review all the, the existing facilities um, and uh, analyze that that data get gathered from the site visits and um, include a summary of, of every park and, and what it's currently used for today. Um, and then provide recommendations and analysis based on that and um, regional, local, and national trends in park and recreation usage for you know, potential projects that you guys could do to upgrade uh, your park facilities, either you know, retrofitting existing stuff or adding new uses and uh, stuff like that. I guess the, um, we're looking at a project timeline of like four to six weeks and the cost is $10,000. Be certainly happy to answer any questions anybody has. Is it unrealistic for us to shoot more for four weeks? Yeah, I mean, the step one is is the site visits and the interviews. I think that it would make a lot of sense to do both of those things sort of simultaneously, where we just kind of pick a day that works for everyone and we just we spend it touring the parks and sort of spitballing ideas from there. So as soon as you guys can decide who you want to be on there and we can get everyone's schedules uh, you know we can start so if we can start then yes okay are there any other questions from the board is is this something that we could pay for out of the grant money or the federal money that um are you talking about our rescue monies yes Theoretically, we could, but I, I wouldn't uh, recommend it. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that's just my personal opinion. But yes, we, we, we could. I mean, I, well, I mean, there's some restrictions, but I think the restrictions have recently lifted as far as what the rescue monies can, can and be used for. I'm not certain that consulting or strategic planning is allowed, but it, it could be. Oh, I, I was actually referring to the, the actual work of redesigning the parks and implementing new equipment and so forth. I think the hope would be that we find grants for a lot of those things, yeah. but we won't know until we get the plan back and see what they recommend and um, what see what's out there at the time. I mean, the, the problem is we won't know until we get the, the, the plan back from Gilmore and then we'll all have to get together and say, or, you know, it'll go through Parks and Rec and they'll say, hey, we want to do this, we want to do that. And then they'll bring it to us. I mean, by the time it gets back to us, reality is probably summer, you know, yeah. by the time we get it back and say, okay, here's the, the Parks and Rec's recommendation. We won't know at that point what grants, there could be more grants, there could be less grants. Um, yeah, no, I get it. I, I just thought that if, um... If we were able to do this very expeditious, expeditiously, um, we might be able to apply for funds because- The, the goal, I mean, I, I can only speak for me, but the, I think the goal is to apply for funds no matter what we do, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. I mean, if we can get essentially what is our tax money back to us, we should do it every time, right? I mean, I don't, what, what would be the harm in that? So- The, the timeline. That's yeah, what I'm saying, referring but, to. But there's always there's always new grants and new money coming out. So the, I think that's always the goal. Let's figure out what's out there. As soon as we figure out what we want to do, and we can see what's out there. Mm -hmm. Project for econ. Well, I think they'll be doing stuff more before then. <laughs> Are there any other questions from the board? Are there any questions from the public? Um, so we have before us uh, 
sorry, what I'm doing. Consideration of the yeah. Uh, so that's what I was gonna say. We're calling it consideration. We're actually consideration of the Gilmore proposal. We have in front of us the proposal for the Laguna Strategic Park Planning Project. Um, is there a motion? So moved. Is there a second. second? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, so we have authorized the Gilmore proposal for Lower Gwinnett Strategic Planning Project. Thank you. Next up is the request to um, authorize advertisement for the summer camp help. I think we had job description and an outline um, identified in our manager's report that talked about the hiring of summer help for $14 an hour. Um, and the requirements were, was it 16 or 14? Oh, no, this is actually the one that's over the age of 21. No, that's camp yeah. director. Yeah, there's different yeah. ones. Camp yeah. counselors are eight. Oh, okay, so they're all there yeah. just listed in totality um, yeah. with different pay based upon the different job description. Um, is there a total amount of summer help that we're hiring for, or we're just putting this out? We usually do it based on the amount of people that are uh, um, signed up for the camp. So it's based on enrollment? Yes. Okay. So are there any questions from the board? Are there any questions from the public? Um, so is there a motion to authorize the advertisement for summer camp help? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We have approved and authorized the advertisement for summer camp help. Next is the request to authorize advertisement for the seasonal summer help and public works. I think this is the one we tabled from last week. Um, in front of us is a job description um, that outlines the hourly rate as well as the age. Does it say the age? I thought I read the age. Uh, the age was that uh, at the last meeting. Oh, we talked they about it. They had to be at least 16. Yeah. So it doesn't indicate it here, but I'm sure when it is circulated, it'll indicate it. They must have a PA, drop, you know, valid driver's license, pass for drug and alcohol screening. And 16 is the minimum age that that can. That, that's in here. It is in here. Okay, yes. I thought I read it. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay, so are there are any questions related to the um, seasonal, seasonal summer help in public works? And that's for two seasonal. Mm -hmm. Any question from the public? Is there a motion to approve and authorize the advertisement for seasonal summer help in public works? Yes, so moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We have passed and authorized the and authorized the advertisement for seasonal summer help in public works. Next up is the consideration to purchase trash can lids in park in parks and the rototiller for public works. Are we doing these together or Fred, do you go on separately? Do it together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's a twofer. Um, so we have in front of us the 2022 capital budget allocated funds for the purchase of 40 new trash can lids for the parks and trails. Um, some are currently missing and or damaged. So this is a replacement of all 40, is that correct, Craig? Correct. And uh, we have it attached to the copy of the proposal. The cost is a tally of $4,340. Um, is there any questions from the board? I make a motion to approve said purchase. Second. I guess we're skipping the public. I'm sorry. Oh, oh. All those in favor? You can still take their comments. No, I know. I know. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? We've approved the and authorized the trash can lid um, proposal for parks and rec. Um, the rototiller for public works. Um, it's the allocation of funds for rototiller. And rototiller, I think there was a picture included in our manager's report. It, it's basically we were renting one at a time, and this is for us to own one. Is that accurate? Um, and we work on the baseball fields and the park, and we use it for other projects as it relates to things that have to be tilled. Are there any questions <laughs> for Fred or, or are there any other additional questions from the board? Question from the public. Is there a motion to approve and accept um, consideration for a purchase of the road to for public works? So moved. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. We have approved and authorized. Uh, the road to for public works. Next up is the consideration to accept the dedication for the sewer line at 1000 DeKalb Pike. Um, it seems pretty straightforward, but I'll let Craig explain it. I'm going to go to Jamie. She's been working on this for months. So uh, there you go, Jamie. might as well have something to say. It is your time to shine, Jamie. Let's go. <laughs> just in front of you is just the 
township has to accept the dedicated sewer line that was installed um, at 100 DeKalb Pike and um, allow for the neighboring property at 1621 Gypsy Hill to connect into that force main upon acceptance. Um, the sewer solicitor did want the motion to include, um, he did want that the, the motion to include the condition that all professional services service costs are reimbursed to the township for the maintenance escrow and the tapping fee reimbursement due um, to the owner from adjacent uh, property with the remaining balance refunded to the owner. So the what we have a maintenance escrow established for this project, we will pay off what is owed to the township with the remaining balance and anything that's left over will be returned to the owner at 100 to Cal Pike. Okay, I I'm, I'm don't see those that exact language written in anything that we have. Is it just something that he it's provided It's just something to you? that you want to have said in the motion to approve it. All right, so say to approve from, it. I don't see it where it's online where I can actually read it. Can we make the motion? Based upon Jamie's recommendation of the approved <laughs> language to approve, accept the dedication for sewer line at 100 DeKalb Pike. Actually, I have a question. Oh, go ahead. Did Mr. Ferrandino sign these documents yet? He did sign and notarize okay. them. Is that good? That's it. All right. Um, okay. Or before we go move forward, are there any questions from the board? Any questions from the public? So based upon um, Jamie's exact language related to the um, dedication of the sewer line at the 100 DeKalb Pike, um, is there a motion to move, <laughs> to move forward? So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. We have approved and accepted the dedication according to Jamie's language for the sewer line at the 100 DeKalb Pike. Thank you so much. Um, committee reports is 835. How many committees have met in the interim? Is it EAC and Park and Rec? I don't think EAC has met. Okay, uh, just Park and Rec? Just Park and Rec and really we just discussed the um, sign ordinance, which everyone was in favor of after they got some questions, we got some questions answered. Um, the, the park proposal, which we're all very excited about. Um, and then Sandy put together this, it's, we'll be debuting it sometime soon. Um, we'll have a demonstration here at a meeting, hopefully, but it's a great interactive trails map that's really going to help, you know, the public better use um, and understand our, our trail system. So we're, we're excited about that as well. I think that, did I miss anything that we talked nope, about the meeting? that was all. The, and, and as it relates to the discussion about your proposal, they're aware that they can put somebody, some member of the Park and Rex board on your committee. They just didn't pinpoint anybody at that, at that particular meeting. So. Okay. I'd just like to add that um, the subcommittee of the EAC, which is the energy committee, there, there are multiple subcommittees, but this one met and they're gonna have their second meeting um, pretty soon. And um, I'm, I'm putting out a, a request for the public to get involved in this uh, committee. It's, it's gonna be looking at um, energy conservation for the township. So if you're interested, please contact um, Melinda Wolf. Actually, they can just contact, can they just apply online and, and indicate their interest in the EAC as an associate sure. member? That's so the, right. the online portal allows volunteer applications just to be submitted by you entering your information. So if they do that and indicate EAC, that should be good to go as an associate member. They don't even have to, I, I don't know that they have to fulfill um, the requirements for an associate member for a subcommittee. Okay. I don't know what the rules are for that. Well, I don't know that there I, are I'm not um, as fluent in the bylaws of the EAC, <laughs> but I appreciate, I guess, that request for additional um, help for the energy subcommittee. I don't know, um, Janine, do you want to speak to the Pike Fest inaugural meeting, or is it something we're not ready to share yet? Uh, well, I think we should meet with Yes, so I think that there was some discussion at, with the Pike Fest inaugural meeting and we did, I'm, I'm on that committee with Janine, but Janine is leading it, um, just more of an observer. <laughs> um, they have conversations about what the Pike Fest is gonna look like. Everybody's energized and excited, but I think they have to have additional meetings in order to make a determination so that we can make any larger announcement 
I think that's where we are at this in this stage. Coming soon. Coming soon, <laughs> but it's starting to sound exciting. Yeah. Um, I guess now is the time for. Is there any public comment for anything that's not on the agenda? Anyone? Public yes. comment. Is that it's you? Car it's Carmina. Oh, I'm sorry. Is there Can other everybody hear me? Hello. Is it somebody online? It's Carmina. Oh, Miss Taylor. Is it you, Carmina? Yes. Is speaking. We do have somebody in person who is getting ready to speak, but then we'll come right to you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Dan Steinman, 800 North Sound Road, Spring House. Question: Has the resolution on term limits for supervisors been tabled? It wasn't on the agenda. That is correct. Pardon? It is not on the agenda for today. Ah, well. It's been enjoyable hearing what's going on, <laughs> <laughs> but it was still on your website at six thirty. I don't think it was ever on the agenda. We what? advertised. We advertised. I got your letter and it. I saw the advertisement. Yeah, we just advertised it. But you tabled it. We didn't table it. I didn't place it on the agenda to okay. table. Thanks. <laughs> but if you have any comments about, yeah. it, you can feel, feel free, free to share. Yeah, yeah you can. Oh. That's you why can you're here. Speak. Yeah, you can still. One, I'm very satisfied with what all the supervisors have done over the years. I question only the approach to this. Uh, has there been any public call, either pro or con, for changing uh, the, it affects all the people in the township, both those who wanna seek office or retain office. I personally have no particular leaning either way, but I think it's something that should be considered to get as much public information in before you make your decision. Thank you. Appreciate you coming out, Mr. Steinman, and sharing your opinion. And that's part of why it's not on the agenda. We wanna hear from the public at large. Um, so it's allowing ample time for anyone and everyone to come forward and kind of share their perspective. That's at least my perspective is as far as why it's not on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think there was somebody online. Uh, Carmina? Can you guys hear me? You can. Can you just state your name and your address? Well, this is Carmina Taylor. I am definitely a former resident, but I wanted to give you an update um, about the request I made last month um, about the signage in Penland. I wanted to just make everyone aware that I joined the Historical Society. I also applied for the Historical Commission and I also got quotes on the signage for Penland. So I wanted to make that on record because I've done my due diligence and I need guidance as to what would be next. I'm at the Wilson School Board meeting in the bathroom, so I would not be distracted. Um, so I don't know if you can hear me or not. Not like literally in the bathroom, but in the stall. So I wouldn't. <laughs> not in the stall, but in the space. No, I understand, Um As far as as far as next steps, I think that you were specifically talking about implementing or putting in the signs based upon the, I think your planned affair in, in April? Is, is no, that no, mean? not at all. Not at okay. all. I said the last comment I made um, at the last meeting is that I understood what you said that, you know, it would be ambitious, but mm -hmm. I wanted to be diligent in moving forward with all the three things that were recommended. And I don't want to tell the quotes publicly, like, I don't want to discuss that, but I no, have it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just saying that I'm ready to work with somebody to move forward. But I also, I believe Tessie um, encouraged me to apply. I, I did, and I haven't heard anything. And I've also joined the Wissahickon Historical Society. So three major things have evolved since I last was at your board meeting. And I wanted you to know that so we can continue to move forward. Obviously not with the intention to do anything in April but to know that um, other steps have been made. So Carmina, this is Janine Martin. Um, so thank you for, for the update. I, I will just say, I think in terms of next steps, I think we gave the public and, and Danielle can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we gave the public until 
tonight or until today? Yeah, till today to to uh, apply for the various um, committees, including the historical commission. And so the next step is we'll be we as a board, you know, we'll figure out um, conduct interviews, and then we will hopefully soon be appointing members to those committees. And then I think for for you, whether you're on the committee or not, that, that would be the best way for you to interface um, and plan this idea, um, get the committee on board. And then the committee's job is to make a recommendation to the, to the supervisors. So I think that that's where, the, in terms of next steps, that's probably gonna be the best way to move forward. I just wanted to be clear. I didn't know when the deadline was, so. Okay. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And we, we were just giving people about, it's about, you know, a month and a half to, to fill out their applications. Um, and then, and then we'll be appointing people soon, hopefully. All right. Thank you. I just wanted to go on record. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any other comments online? I thought I saw a hand, but I couldn't yeah, see any. She, uh, she, there was a hand up, but it went up. No, it's back. Okay. <laughs> oh, Ms. Jones. Um, can you just state your name and your address? And you have to probably unmute. Um, Gloria Jones, uh, 1007 Pershing Road, Penland, uh, PA. Um, I'm not saying that what has been presented about um, Penland Village and signs doesn't include valid criticism and feelings. But how it is presented, uh, I have a little problem with. Um, there's no inherent wrong in acknowledging differing and opposing views. But there may be if the disagreement is marked by misinformation or missing information. Um, I'm very serious about uh, Penn Lens recognition. I, be very, I believe very strongly that the historical truth of Lower Gwinnett Township be recognized and inclusive because for well over a hundred years, a successful African-American community resided in Penland Village. And the history of this relevant segment of Lower Gwinnett Township should not and cannot be erased. So I don't believe that any hurry up solutions be made at this time. We did have a previous historic committee in which I was on some time ago. It was chaired by the late Herb Levy who had some validity of recognizing period architecture. And we had discussed at that time that perhaps Penland Village itself could be listed as a historic district. However, for some reason, the historic um, committee stopped meeting and the board did not follow through on it. And there was some talk in the community that if it became a historic district, that it would um, kind of affect their property and how it was being used. So I am very, um, uh, it's very important to me that whatever is done about this be valid and well researched. And I understand that you will be having a historic committee. And I think that is the time when this should be discussed because I certainly do not want uh, Penland Village to be erased from the history of Lower Gwinnett Township. It's been a very serious thing. And we have talked with other, for over two years, we talked with some of the other board members and people who are running for election that Penland be recognized and that valid historic signs be erected in Penland. So that's how I feel about it. This is not something new with us. This has been going on for quite a long time. And I think that uh, Penland or Lower Gwinnett uh, should have the opportunity of having its own historic committee uh, looking into this matter and working on it. And I thank you for hearing me out. Thank you, Ms. Jones. 
that is the intention of, of this board as far as forming the historic committee. We're not making any rush decisions, but we're gonna leave it to the historic com committee to make recommendations to the entire board. Hello. I thank you. I thank you for those comments. Hello. Oh, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. My phone was ringing, oh. <laughs> okay. but I, I I can hear you, and I, I'm very uh, serious. I think we should work and get more information from the total uh, community. I think it's very important. And some time ago, I promised some of the uh, older members of our community and our older generation that I would do everything in my power to see that Penland Village uh, had a place in Lower Gwinnett Township's history. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your comments. Um, are there any additional comments or, uh, from the public? No? Okay, so before we move forward, there's, there is, um, there's a, a quick demonstration that we're gonna do regarding, I guess, the update to our website as it relates to um, the ability to pay taxes. Tomorrow, which is March 1st, um, tax bills will be released. I know it's a joyous time for all, um, but our, our new tax collector has made um, it accessible and a little bit easier to pay tax payments um, or your tax bills online. So I think Jamie's gonna walk us through um, how to access the ability to pay that online from the township website. <coughs> and the ease through which you can do so. So you go to the homepage. Yep. You start here and then you go to departments, to finance, and then on right here on the right-hand side, taxes. Okay. When you click on that, it brings you to the tax collector page. So the tax collecting has an entire page and I think there's a big green button where it says, what does it say? Pay your real estate tax. <laughs> Electronically, <laughs> yeah. Is there a button for someone else to pay your real estate? <laughs> 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 so if you want to go, you go to our homepage, go to departments, go to tax or finance, and then on the right hand side is tax and then you're coming to this green button that's going to bring you to this page. Um, so it's a simple online form, but I know that there's always hesitation <laughs> about paying things online. I think the advantage of this is that it is secure. It is encrypted so you can enter in your parcel number or do a search. Um, and then you enter owner and your address and then you confirm information as well as how you want to pay. You enter in your first and last name as it relates to the billing information and your credit card number, so forth and so on. Um, it only charges you 50 cents wow. to pay this online and you do get an immediate receipt. And our tax collector is on the call, but I, from my conversation with her just briefly, she indicated that if you do this online and get an electronic receipt, she does have the ability to print additional receipts for you at no charge. Um, so you're going to pay 50 cents, you're going to get your receipt immediately, and then you can get additional receipts just by be, because of the fact that you did this electronically. That doesn't negate the fact that you can pay the traditional way, um, where you can go in person or you can mail, um, but this is just another added convenience um, that's just recently been updated as far as the ability to pay online. So if you have any questions or concerns, I think when you go to departments and you go to finance under, finance is the tax collector's portion of our webpage. Mm -hmm. Contact information as well as an email address and a telephone number are listed, but this is just an added service um, that's recently been added. So you're going to departments, going to finance, going to taxes along the right hand side. And there you go. So there's, kind of, there's information as far as the address to pay your taxes, the telephone number, email address, and the ability to pay it online. Is there any additional questions from the Board of Supervisors? This is just a quick tutorial so that everybody knows that this does exist, knowing that tax bills will be going out tomorrow or should probably be hitting your- they, 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 yeah. yeah, you're probably yeah. getting up tomorrow. Danielle, can I just say one quick thing? It's Natalie. Absolutely. Absolutely, um, go ahead, Natalie. 50 cents for the e-check, but it's 2% if you pay it with a credit card. Okay. So, so if you pay for, a, if you use a check online where you put in your routing and your bank account and information, it's 50 cents. But if you use your credit card, you're going to get charged 2%. Correct. Correct. And when, when you do do it, please make sure to click the yes button. <laughs> that you're paying your county and your township. People had some problems this weekend. Okay. And when you do go into the search, it's your last eight digits with no um, dashes. So where are you saying the last eight digits with no dashes well, of, your, of your parcel? Yep, you have to go hit the blue button. 
of the search. The top, yeah, the search blue button. And that is your last eight digits with no dashes. No dashes. And then it will automatically autofill with your name and your address. Gotcha. And how much you are going to pay. And it'll automatically do the discount. Okay. So we currently are. Go ahead. That's it. Okay. So I know we know that this is recorded. We're kind of doing this as a service so that if, if you, you know, can go back and look online later, you can see somebody walk you through about what it looks like to pay it online. If there's any questions, you can reach out to Natalie directly. Thank you. No, thank you. Um, just a, before we go to the manager's report, I know that last, oh no, it's not last. There's like probably three meetings ago, there was a question from someone in the public around Worcester Road um, and concerns related to the traffic and the traffic patterns. And I uh, think we were waiting for some information from the county before we could update it. Um, so Chad, are you able to answer? Um, we were able to talk with the County Roads and Bridges Department um, since that meeting uh, recently um, about the concerns out at the intersection they agree and understand the concerns that were expressed out there. I think one of the possible solutions that was thrown out and by the resident and in the public comment period pertained to possibly putting in a multi-way stop uh, control at the intersection or potentially other improvements, um, you know, similar to, to other instances on county roads in the past. Um, any type of new traffic control or changes to existing traffic control, um, those um, have to be adopted by ordinance by the township and enforced by the township. Mm -hmm. And therefore, um, the county's policy is that the traffic study uh, that's required to establish any warrants for changes in traffic control um, must be completed um, by the township at their expense um, for the county's review. Um, so if the township would like to move forward, they would certainly um, entertain, you know, a study completed by the township and any recommendations made. Um, we are currently in the process of preparing a proposal for the board's consideration at your first meeting in March. Um, to conduct that study and engage the County Roads and Bridges Department further. Okay, thank you so much for that update. I appreciate sure. it. Um, any questions from the board? On to the manager's report. Well, at 8.55, I don't have much. I just want to uh, acknowledge uh, Ken Bright's uh, long time contribution to Lower Gwinnett Township. Uh, Chief Bright passed away last week. Um, so he had uh, almost 40 years of service here to Lower Gwinnett Township and um, yeah, just acknowledge his life and his uh, contribution to Lower Gwinnett. Thank you. Um, is there, well, I guess we'll start with the supervisor comments, Tessie. Uh, I don't have any comments. Thank you. Kathleen. I just have a question. Are we back to Tuesdays for March or are we continuing with our Mondays any longer? Mondays through March. Through March. Monday through March. So you guys are still hanging in there? No, no, no we're, we're done. done. Well, we didn't. We're yeah. done. But I think we had our, our, what we advertised was through March. Yeah. Yes. A then, thank you. We were trying to ambitious with their prospects. Thank you. Thank you. Aww. Are yeah. they all the terminal? They are out of it. Uh -huh. If they did, Janine. Uh, no, nothing. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Mike. No comments. Thank you. Um, I just want to say that we're going to do better with our time moving forward. Um, <laughs> I blame Craig. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Guys we just have so much to do. <laughs> I think I thank you guys all for coming out. I thank everybody for participating and joining online. Um, can hey, I wait? Hey, before we go. This is Lynn Smith, 507 Hobby Horse. On yes. that tax collecting and doing it online. Yes. I hope it's clearly marked that if you pay by credit card, you get charged 2% because I would hate to see somebody get charged that fee and not realize it. I do believe it is identified. I hope, it's like, I ho I hope it's like bold and you can't miss it. You know? 
I don't know it, how bold it is, but I thank you for that feedback and we'll, we will pass that along. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I thank you so much for, for everybody that participated. I'm looking for a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. The meeting is adjourned. Thank you guys. Danielle, what, what 2%? Great, I have a question.